guidance, the wisdom, and the strength to, to be blessed by the sermon that you will give us, Father God. Lord, bless Pastor Darby, bless his voice, Father. Bless his wonderful, powerful preaching voice, Father, so that he may direct this message, this message to us, Father. Lord, let us be blessed by this message. Lord, let the people watching on social media be blessed by this message, Father. And Lord, let us add this to our daily lives, Father. Lord, let you give us traveling mercies after after this service, Father, after this wonderful service. And Lord, let you be the one who guides us, shields us, and protects us, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, CJ. Awesome, awesome worship and awesome prayer. Thank you, CJ, for being a humble servant, hallelujah, willing to serve the body of Christ. So I thank everybody who's here. Um, it's funny because CJ tried to peek at the message. He was like trying to get ahead. <laughs> I'm just reading the title. <laughs> but a lot of the worship he um, dealt with has to do with the message. And one of the things he said is that we are free now to worship wherever we are. In the Old Testament, we had to review our sins to a priest, and that priest would go with our um, offering and go into the temple once our offering was burnt on the altar. Now we no longer have to go to someone. The only someone we go to is Jesus. Um, and that's what we have to keep in mind that the proper theology is, we don't have to go to a father now to ask forgiveness. The only father we go to is our father God. Jesus is the only way to our salvation. He paid the ultimate price for us. So we go to Jesus, we pray to Jesus. He's our intercessor, our lawyer. He goes to the father and says, I lived in their shoes, give them another chance. All it takes is a little faith. Even as of a faith of a mustard seed. And today's message is going to talk about that. It's going with the same series we were talking about, walking in our newness. And it's talking about maintaining unity in the body of Christ. And we just had this conversation. I like having a little question and answer period, talking with you guys and just any questions you may have. And it usually leads to the message. So, for example, you guys were bringing up about family and how sometimes families can cause us trauma. You know, they can cause us stress. In the body of Christ, you can also get stressed in the body of Christ. It's just not as pronounced compared to the body of, of family members outside the body of Christ. Now, here's the key. The reason it's not as stressful in the body of Christ is because it only is not as stressful if you all have kingdom vision. That means that you're keeping your eyes on Christ. But not everybody that comes to church has their eyes on Christ. So one of the things I tend to teach people is that when you go to church, we tend to get comfortable, which is good, because we feel we're in a comfortable place. We feel we're in a safe environment. But here's the thing, there's a lot of people who go to church, they're not going with the purpose of getting closer to God, they're going with the purpose that they think you're a target. Meaning that we get so comfortable, we go to church, let's say for example, the ladies. The ladies will be, will be quick and put their purse on the side, right? And if they have to go to the restroom, they'll be like, I'm in church, so I'm gonna leave my purse there, I'm sure it'll be fine. But there's somebody in church who's not there to praise the Lord and is looking to see who's so trusting, who's so vulnerable, and they're going to go and hurt that vulnerability. They can attack that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And it's sad because I've seen that happen. Um, we had men meet up together and we'll invite men who don't serve the Lord. And immediately, as soon as they come into the temple of the Lord, they get comfortable and they feel, okay, I can leave my jacket here. I don't have to worry about it. And I don't know about many men here, I tend to keep my wallet always on my person. It's never gonna go in my jacket, it's always on my person. I told, teach my wife, you never take sight off your purse. Your purse should be always near you or somewhere where you can lock up safe environment, right? Because there's people who are targeting people, they're looking for your vulnerability. So I'm saying all that for the simple fact is, is that we're, the church is filled with imperfect people striving for perfection in Christ. So in order for that to happen, we have to have a kingdom vision, meaning is I want these people to grow in the spirit of Christ. So in order for us to maintain unity, that means one of us has to die. Because like we mentioned in the messages a couple of back, the um, anagram of joy, Jesus first, being intentional with others, and us last. We don't think of ourselves. We should be thinking of others, those around us to our left and right. 
Now, then comes a sacrifice with that because there's a vulnerability that's revealed. So one of the things that happens in families, and let's be honest, for those who have siblings is, is that sometimes there's sibling rivalries. There's jealousy in the family um, between the firstborn and the secondborn. And if you have like uh, brother CJ here who has a couple of brothers, CJ's the middle child, and um, sometimes they, 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 they may think he's the favorite, you know? And it's funny because uh, CJ is quick to point out DJ's the favorite, the last born. Yep. But if you ask DJ, DJ will be like, CJ's the favorite. What? <laughs> so he's over there. He's not paying attention to us. He's like, he's in his own world. But, <laughs> but that's what happens in families. Usually everybody has their own opinion of who they think is the favorite. And usually they don't think they're the favorite. Okay? Now that can cause division. And it could cause division, especially if the family members are participating in that division. One thing we don't realize is, is that um, as parents, we may like a child more than another. Let's be real, it may happen. And the reason is, is because that child may remind you more of you. It takes two people to make a, bring a child into this world. So they may get a personality from one person or the other, or sometimes it's a combination of both, you know? If you look at, for example, again, bringing up um, CJ and his brothers, uh -oh. you can tell the differences who they took upon more than the other. Some came out more like the mom, some came out like, more like the dad. You just have to just have a dialogue with them and figure it out, you know? So, and sometimes what we tend to do is that we gravitate to the person that's most like us. And in church, we do that as well, in the body of Christ. We gravitate to those who are so similar to us. And what ends up happening is sometimes you get little clicks, which should not be, because the church says there should be, uh, the Bible says there should be no favoritism. Yeah. So you get little clicks that develop, little groups, and then these people only hang out with those groups, which is not good, okay? It does a disservice to the body, because we're all one in the body, so we should be able to get to know each other. Are you gonna like one person more than the other? Yes, it's gonna happen, let's be real. We're human on this earth. You might like one person more than the other but we're supposed to love everybody in Christ, okay? So going with the example of family, we're gonna to go to Genesis chapter 37, verses one through 11. Genesis 37, verses one through 11. And I'm gonna be reading it in the New International Version. Okay, and we're gonna read this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And verse one, it says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flock to his brothers, the sons of Belah and sons of Zephalah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate or fancy robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved them more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Verse five, Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves or stacks of grain out in the field when suddenly my stack rose and stood upright. While your stacks gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your ma mother and I, your brothers, actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So we see in these verses, so far we see the father is highly favoring Joseph. And we see that after the fact, Joseph has a dream that is a prophetic dream that the Lord is revealing to him. And here's the thing with prophetic dreams. Are all dreams supposed to be revealed to everyone? No. 
That dream, that message the Lord is giving is to you. Now, if the Lord wants it to be revealed to anyone else, he will tell you. And at times, he will share it with others. So it will be a shared dream. So in terms of Joseph, his actions of sharing that dream, it sounded like he was boasting. Like he was kind of like trying to raise himself above his brothers. And part of that was probably taking place because his father was already setting him aside and kind of separating him from his brothers and giving him special treatment. Now, can that happen in the church as well? Yes. Sometimes ministers will gravitate to someone and will raise that person up, which you shouldn't. You should treat everyone the same. There should be no favoritism in church and in the body of Christ. But sometimes it does occur. And what ends up happening is that jealousy will brew in the body of Christ. Now, how can we disarm that? First of all, as a servant in Christ, we have to remember to have a kingdom vision. We keep our eyes on Christ. We don't look at man. We don't fall in love with man. We can love man, but we don't fall in love. And the reason I mention that is because sometimes we can fall in love with our pastors, our preachers, our teachers. We can love them, but we shouldn't fall in love with them in the sense of to the point that you raise them to a pedestal higher than God. No one is higher than God. And we see one of the things that's been occurring in a lot of churches lately, popular churches, is that we raise people to a high esteem, higher than God. We fall in love with personality. So for example, for those who sat in class with me prior, there's a lot of um, preachers that are very well known. I don't like to use the word famous, but that's what they are. They're becoming celebrity pastors because they're becoming well known and people are falling in love with their personality. So for example, there was a famous um, well-known preacher who as he came on up, he started changing the way he dressed to be more relatable to the younger crowd. So he started wearing very expensive sneakers, especially when he preached. To the point, it started an Instagram page that a guy does to embarrass people who do stuff like that. It's called Preacher Sneakers. And the whole point is to embarrass preachers who are wearing sneakers that are worth more than most people's salaries. All because they want to be relatable and popular. So for example, there's a well-known preacher who wears $1,000 sneakers. We see, for example, I'm gonna start naming names. I'm sorry, I am, because you know, I keep it real. <laughs> T.D. Jakes is one that does that sometimes. Um, you have Kenneth Copeland, that one time, for being a, a senior person, he was wearing sneakers, and it was gold laces, actually 14 karat gold and so on, and he says, God is so powerful that he blessed me that even to the tip of my feet, I'm, I'm, I'm Basically, he was saying, like, you know, he has gold on his shoes. And then he proceeded to dance, showing off the sneakers. Mm-hmm. We're not called to show off. We're called to remain humble. That has no place at the altar, and it definitely has no place in the house of God. And it's a shame that there has to be a website that's called Preacher Sneakers to embarrass preachers from stopping to do nonsense like this. The only thing that should be at the altar in church should be the word of God. That should be the emphasis. That's what should be lifted up. Christ Jesus, as he was lifted up on the cross, is who should be lifted up at all times in church. No one else. Okay? So when we see the, um, what's going on here in Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 11, we see that God constantly uses the lives of Bible characters to teach us and to encourage us and also to warn us. We know that the Bible has impact in our lives. It's evidence of our faith. But it also shows us, because one thing that I, I try to teach you guys as we go on is, there's two words in, in that is used in theology to understand the Bible. Descriptive and prescriptive. Descriptive means it describes. Doesn't mean God is saying this. It doesn't mean God gives the okay or yes to this. It means God is allowing this to be recorded to remind people what's going on at that time. Then there's prescriptive, things that God says you must do. These are things you have to do. These are things in order to continue walking in the faith you have to do. Prescriptive, like a prescription when you pick up at your pharmacy. So, for example, when you read in the Bible someone getting raped, that's being descriptive. Because God will never ask anyone to be raped. Now, God saying that you have to follow Jesus, the Son, that only through Jesus you are saved, that's prescriptive. When God says through Jesus 
that we're called to be disciples and disciple makers. We're called to go out and bring the gospel and live the gospel. That's prescriptive. There's no church on this earth. If you're not going out, you're not being following the word of God. You have to go out. The word can't just stay here. It has to go out. Okay? So we see through the lives of David, Esther, Moses, Jonah, even Peter, Paul, it's impossible to leave truth in the realm of theory and logic. When you see it revealed in the lives of real life men and women, these are real life men and women we're speaking of. We see that these are divinely inspired biographies. They refine and clarify truth and weave it into the fabric of everyday living. Through the word of God, we see truth revealed and it helps us live a Christ-centered life. Romans 15, 4 says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. You know, there's some churches that teach that you don't no longer have to read the Old Testament, which is incorrect. We have the whole Bible, not half a Bible. We have the whole Bible. The Old Testament is Christ revealed. Then we have the New Testament, which is Christ incarnate, that he was born into the flesh. So we need both. The Old Testament was preparing the nation for Christ to be born in the flesh. So you can't have one without the other. When you read your New Testament, what you're reading is people preaching the word of God based on the Old Testament, because they didn't have the New Testament. So they were living the New Testament, but they didn't have the New Testament. They were teaching and preaching from the Old Testament. So we need the full Bible of God, okay? So we see from Romans 15, 4 that what was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So we see that if we read this verse correctly, there are two basic reasons God allowed us to have the Old, taste, Old Testament. It's for study and application. We see first, it presents instruction, and second, for a future hope. What's the future hope? The return of Christ Jesus. That he returned and we'd be ready to go with him. Is it easy being ready? No. How many of you ever try to get ready for work and your clothes are laid out and you go, nah, I want to change. I don't think this is what I want to wear. Right? Last minute you change. I went to service earlier today. I didn't have a tie. And then I said, no, I think I'm going to have to put on a tie today because I don't like the way my collar's flip-flopping around. You know? I'm picky like that. <laughs> so, you know, there has to be change. And we always have to be ready to be ready for the coming of Christ. So if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, and then we're going to read verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, and I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation because I like the way it sounds. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. And it reads as follows. Verse 6 says, These things happened as a warning to us, so that we will not crave evil things as they did. And verse 11 says, These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of age. What is the end of age? The return of Christ. We're waiting for his return. And until his return, the word of God helps educate us. It helps build us up. And it includes the Old Testament. So if you notice, in verse 6 and verse 11, both start with these things happen. Happen for what? Purpose. As a warning to us. They happen as examples. We have a word of God that's living. It's a living example for us how we should be walking in Christ. And we can't take it for granted. One of the things we're doing together is reading the Bible together. It's important to be immersed. One of the messages we continue preaching here is that we need to be immersed in the Word of God. What does it mean, immersed? If you take a cup, right, you're not just trying to fill it with water. When you immerse it, you're sinking it in. The water is covering both the inside and out. That's what we want with the Word. We want the Word not to just enter us. We want it to cover us completely, inside and out. That it transform our lives, you know? I remember there was a baptism I saw once, right? And little kids are the most truthful people in the world. They keep it real. 
So this kid was ready to get baptized, right? And if you've been to a baptism, you know, the priest, the father, depending where what church you go to, brings them down, immerses them, and brings them up, right? So as they continue bringing people in, they're rotating people out. So, you know, one person comes in one side, then they come out the other side. The kid is waiting in line, and this kid reminds me of a child that I dealt with in vacation Bible school. The kid was so excited, you could see it. It was stirring in them, and they're like, waiting, waiting. They're like, I just want to do this. I just want to do this. I just want to do this. So then the pastor asks the kid, are you ready? And the kid says, yes. And he comes in. And as the pastor asks, because, you know, some pastor will ask the, 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 the people who are getting baptized, okay, why do you want to get baptized and so on and so on? So he, the kid just says, I just want to be saved. And before the pastor even tries to dunk him, the kid dunks himself. And he comes up. He goes, am I saved now? Am I saved now? And that's the immersion we need to be, that we just want to be saved. We want to glorify God. We want to be filled with him to the utmost. That's the excitement we should be craving for. And that happens when we in God's word. If you're not in God's word, you're not going to have that. I'm going to be real with you. All you're going to be is wet foot. You just put your foot in the pool and that was it. You need to be immersed, completely filled, saturated with God's word. So we see in the example we mentioned in 10.6, as examples for us, includes all believers. This is not just Paul talking about himself, missionaries. He's talking about everyone in the world needs to be immersed in God's word. That the word is an example for the entire world. He's saying that the Israelites engaged in idolatry, sexual immorality, and even tested God. They grumbled against them. And consequentially, he judged them and sent them to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. Can we learn from that? Yes, we can. First of all, that's a hard lesson to learn. That they were so stubborn that God said, you know, I took you out of Egypt, but I'm going to just keep having you go in circles because you just seem to be doing that anyway. You continue repeating the sin that you keep repeating. So how? why not I just let you keep wandering because you're just too dangerous to let you out into the world. You're supposed to be my image bearers. But since you can continue doing nonsense, then you know what? I'm just going to keep you right here so no one sees the nonsense you're doing. Because you you're going to embarrass me. And we can't have that. You're supposed to be the example for the nation. For those who don't know me, you're supposed to be the example. There's a lot of people who profess they say they're Christians and they're doing some seriously embarrassing stuff. You know? They're not living a Christ-centered life. They're doing things that are against the word of God. We have to understand, yes, we're not perfect, but there should be some evidence of our spiritual growth. It's the same way when you see a child grow. You can see the difference between DJ and CJ in their growth. You can see the difference. You can see the spiritual difference between them as well. There should be a difference we can be able to tell. We see in verse 6, it says, these things, again, it's referring to the people of Israel and some of the things they endured, they experienced. And the same thought as in verse 11, it's emphasizing how God has given us the Old Testament truth to instruct us, to give us hope, to warn us about how we're to live day by day so that we might not crave the evil things of some of our spiritual ancestors crave. Can we learn lessons from the Old Testament? Oh, yes, we can. We can learn, for example... Just because you're a man or woman of God and you're in the royal priesthood, we're all called to be in the royal priesthood. We're supposed to be bringing the gospel out to the world. But in the Old Testament, there was people that were part of the royal priesthood and they had their failings. When Moses was away and the people were clamoring to Aaron, oh, oh, your brother hasn't come back yet. Um, we, should, we should just lift up and make our own idol. He hasn't come back from a message with the word of God yet. And I'm paraphrasing and what did they do? They created a false idol. And God reveals to Moses, look at what your brother's doing. He lifted up a false idol. Now, there's repercussions for sin. There has to be punishment. But at the same time, he reveals to Moses, but there's also a solution to the punishment. The solution is Christ. This was a preemptive of what we're going to have with Christ being on the cross. So what does he have um, Moses do? Once he corrects them and reprimands them, he says, I want you to put a snake on a cross, on a pole, and lift it up. And everyone who lifts, who looks at that pole will be healed. 
because they were bitten by poisonous snakes. Because remember, there's repercussions for sin. So now the solution is the cross. That's the solution we have for our sin. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus in order to keep from sinning. So the Old Testament reveals this. So we see that as we get better acquainted with Joseph, that there's some background information we can find out here. We see his birth in Genesis chapter 30, 24, to, um, all the way to 37, that Joseph's family was in transition. Everyone was unsettled and on the move. A low-level disagreement was brewing and his family clashing, arguing in jealousy and hatred. Remember, at that time, you have family members that had land, they had property, animals, and so on. So one of the things that may happen is as the patriarch, the father is closer in age and he may seem like he's gonna die, the family members are gonna fight. What's gonna be mine? I want my share of the inheritance. Sometimes they're so grieved, they'll be like, before you even in your, in your grave, they're like, I want my share of the inheritance now. And we see that revealed in the Old Testament as well. There is examples of that. And I don't know if you have children, if you ever experienced that, that's a sad thing too. When your children are so spiteful that they tell you, I wish you would be dead because I want my inheritance. I know a family member in Christ that sadly, his kids have said stuff like that. And I think that's just so wrong and so hurtful, especially when you sacrifice so much for your children that your children will say something so sad like that. So we see also from 17 to th um, 30 years of age, Joseph. We see that in Genesis 37, um, verse two, all the way to chapter 41. We see Joseph reaches young manhood. And it seems though, as his life becomes out of control, enslavement, unfair accusation, imprisonment comes upon him. Then we see in Genesis starting in chapter 41, 30 years to death. Joseph's last 80 years are years of prosperity, reward under God's blessing. He had the classic opportunity to get even with his brothers to ruin them forever, but he refused. Instead, he blessed and protected and forgave them. So what does this reveal to us? That we have to be the better person. As men and women of Christ, someone has to be the better person when there's a disagreement, when there's an argument, when there's a debate. Somebody has to say, okay, even if it's not your fault, somebody has to be able to say, I'll take the hit. You know what, please forgive me if this offended you. You know, because if, if that's gonna be the stone that's gonna trip them and have them go out in the world, as believers, we should not want anyone to go out to the world. We want them to stay walking in Christ and the body. Then we should ask forgiveness, even if it wasn't your fault, just so they can continue walking in Christ. And whatever you feel, you have to present to the Lord. I remember an incident in which a, a sister was very angry with me. She felt that I abandoned her. See, people think that when you switch churches, you're leaving people. You don't leave people. You may be disconnected because that person doesn't, it took you for granted. Because we have to understand, relationships are a two-way street, okay? So for example, before CJ and his family came to be with us, I still kept in contact with them. Just because I left the church where they were at, does not, that relationship doesn't end. And some people don't think like that. Not everybody thinks like that. So I kept in contact, they kept in contact. It's a two-way street. That's what friendships are. But not everyone, some people are um, seek beneficial relationships, you know? They use you for whatever benefits or feelings they feel, like a comfort blanket. How many of you remember the peanuts? I know I'm gonna age myself. <laughs> peanuts, Snoopy, stop saying that. <laughs> I like pajamas. So what we see in the peanuts is, you got Linus, who has the, the, his security blanket, right? And he can't be without his security blanket. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we treat our relationships like security blankets. We don't want to let go of them. They comfort us. Mm -hmm. But we don't understand that sometimes Pete, that is for a season. You should be growing to the point that you don't need, the only comforter we need is Jesus. Let's be real, that's the only comforter we need. So what ended up happening in that relationship is that person always found me as a comfort. And when I left, they didn't keep up their part of the relationship. So then they felt abandoned. So what I did, because as the Lord revealed to me through the Holy Spirit, I said, I have to reach out. There's something going on here. I need to make sure there's healing going on. And I took time to sit down and break bread with them. And I'm a big fan of breaking bread and, and, and healing disagreements. And 
I let this person just go off on me. I knew it as soon as the person sat right across from me, they wanted to go off and they want, I could tell in their face, they wanted to curse me out. So I said, say whatever you need to say. Do what you gotta do. And I sat there and took it. And then once I said, that's all off your chest, you feel better now? I'll say, okay. I said, well, I'm sorry if you feel that way. I'm sorry if I ever made you feel that way. Please forgive me. And they forgave me. And I said, good. I said, then if you want to keep part of this relationship, remember it's a two-way street. It isn't just me, it's a two-way street. Did it continue? No, it did. It is what it is. I did my part, I sacrificed, and I took it, and I forgave them. Doesn't mean I don't love them, I still love them. If they ever come calling, I'm still gonna receive them well. And that's what I mean about having that kingdom vision in the body of Christ. Because you know what? I can't be arguing with my fellow brothers and sisters, and then when Jesus comes back, what am I gonna say? Um, so heaven is big enough that I don't have to see that person, right? Um, I don't have to deal with that person. No, if that person is walking correctly in Christ and I'm walking correctly in Christ, I'm gonna run into that person. And all this debate is mute, is meaningless. Because when you're in heaven, you're not even gonna remember what you was arguing about. You're gonna be too busy worshiping the Lord. So it's meaningless. So why are we arguing on this earth? We need to let that stuff go, you know? So that's, that's what this reveals to us. So as we continue looking at these verses, we see in these, this passage, we're gonna go to um, Genesis 37 and we're gonna start on the second half of verse two. Now in the second half of verse two, he says, he brought their father a bad report about them. I don't know if you, if you have siblings, you ever had a sibling that rats you out? You know, that they're quick to, to say when you did something wrong? CJ knows what I'm talking about. Definitely. <laughs> so I, I used to have siblings. I had a, uh, a blended family. So I had a stepbrother for a bit when my mom got with someone who had a child and it was a little bit kind of Brady Bunch kind of thing. And um, it was a brother, a half brother, half sister, stepsister. And I got along with the stepsister, stepbrother now. And what ended up happening is, every time he did something wrong, it was blamed on me. To the point that even my mom believed it. I was like, wow, she picked sides. I said, wow. So it got me upset until she caught on real quick. And then she was like, okay, so it's not all you. I said, it was never me. It's not, not, not part, none of it, it was me. I mean, to the point that my stepbrother, what he used to do when he came to live with us, for those of you who live in apartments, you know when you have window guards, right? Yeah. And they put these guards on your window so you can't open the window too much, right? Because they're afraid the child will fall out the window. It's weird how it's better handled back in the days than it is today, because today you're starting to hear more children fall out of windows compared to back in the days. So what my strip brother used to do is that he would look out the window and since he couldn't see people, but he could hear who was walking underneath the window, and to be a bad person, because he did it with malice, he would urinate outside the window on top of people who were walking underneath the window. And of course, I would get the blame because it was out of my bedroom window. So this is, this is sibling rivalry at its finest. And at that point, my mom believed it, even though she never seen me witness me doing anything like that, and she still believed that it was me for a bit until she finally caught on that it was him. So this is what happens in families sometimes, you know, when there's favoritism. So we see here that in, in that second half, verse two, he brought their father a bad report about them. So he was writing out his brothers. So is that gonna be, be a good relationship between um, brothers? No. Because if that brother's always giving complaints to the parent about their other brothers, there's gonna be animosity, okay? And then we go to verse four. When his brothers saw that their father loved them more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now you have a part there that's very strong. The word hate, that's a very strong word. If you're in the Lord, you should not be able to say that word hate. You may dislike someone, but you can't hate someone. You should be loving them, okay? Now, you can have disagreements. We have to understand that as long as we're on this earth, there's gonna be disagreements. But you cannot hate someone. So we see here that their, his brothers hated him. And part of it was the father's fault for the way he was showing favoritism. 
we see also how many of you ever seen the actual movie and the play based on Joseph and the Technicolor coat, which is the, the big robe that he had. It's a rainbow coat that he had. It was very nice and um, had gold on it and so forth. Uh, for those who ever heard of um, Sight and Sound, it's a Christian um, theater, like Broadway in Pennsylvania. They always play the show. You could um, Google it on YouTube and so on. And what ends up happening is his father gave him that robe. But is that a robe you can work in? No, you can't work in the field in a robe like that. First of all, the robe had long sleeves. His brother's robe was short and had no sleeves. What does that tell you? Did the father expect the brother to work the field? No. He expected the other brothers to work the field, but the, bro the brother who was the youngest, he wanted him at home. He wanted him to be their supervisor. He's the youngest. He should be out there working the field. Now, this is another example for the church as well as well as circular life. If you're a supervisor, it's not as much as what you say, but what you do. You can't tell someone to do something if you don't know how to do it yourself. The worst kind of supervisor is someone who acts like they know it all, but know nothing. And they try to instruct like they know it all. Those are the worst kind of supervisors. A great supervisor is one who admits, I know nothing. I'm always learning. And I'm here to learn with you. So that's the supervisor that's out there with you, doing the things. He's not as much giving instruction that whatever he knows, he's showing you. If you're observing, you're learning by observing. You're seeing what they do. That should be the example for the church as well. The pastor is not as much as what he or she says, is what are they doing? Are they living a Christ-centered life? Understanding that the one who's the head of the church is Jesus Christ. So don't elevate that pastor to the point that they're higher than Christ. Remember who's the head of the church. But if that person is helping you, building you up, discipling you, they should be the living example of what you're supposed to be like. So I can't have, like for example, one of the churches that, that fell recently was a pastor who got in tight with celebrities and was in, in a yacht and he was drinking champagne with that person who came to the Lord. Is that a proper thing? Not that drinking is a sin. It's getting drunk is a sin. Let's be clear. But the fact that he's drinking with people who don't serve the Lord, he's supposed to be a living example. What he should have done is, first of all, you should have not been there. And if you're going to be there, don't drink. We need to be living examples of Christ. We need to know how to carry ourselves better. We have to understand that the only Bible translation most people will read is not the one that they have or you give them or attract. It's the way you compose yourself. That's the translation most people will read. People will know if you're Christian without you saying it. You don't have to shout it. They will know. The anointing of the Spirit will reveal it. So we see here that by Joseph sharing the dream, was he kind of like show it off a little bit when he shared that dream? Oh, yeah. It looks like he was showing off a bit because his father was already showing favoritism. He has his little special coat. He doesn't have to work the field. And then he has a dream that the Lord reveals that everybody's going to bow down to you. And what is he doing? Sharing that with everyone and rubbing it in their face. You're going to have to bow down to me. You're going to have to bow down to me. You're going to have to bow down to me. And what does the father do? He, he gets upset. But it was an environment he created by starting with favoritism. There should be no room for favoritism. Everybody should be treated equally. If you do something wrong, correct that person with love. And if there's other children in the household, do the same with each of them the same way. I'm a firm believer in that you correct everyone the same way. That's a pet peeve of mine. I've always told people, people I counsel, I said, I, I don't baby people. I don't hold people's hands. When you do something wrong, I will tell you, you did something wrong. If you hold the leadership position and you did something wrong, you need to sit down. And I'm not saying just for a month. It may be for a period of time. Some churches only sit you down for like a month or, or two days or three days. Depending on what, what occurred, 
and the damage that occurred to the temporary body of Christ, because it is temporary, because everything is temporary. What's permanent is Jesus. The damage is temporary. It can be fixed if people are willing to work it out. Then, if everybody has that kingdom vision, it will get worked out. Things will get solved. Okay? So we see Joseph starts touting, like he's blowing up his chest, like, yo, you guys going to have to bow down to me. So what do the brothers do? They start planning on killing him. You know, that says a lot about that relationship. When you're planning to kill your own family member, that is drastic. It is drastic. I mean, there's so many things you could do. Like, you, remember, these are the fields in the Old Testament. You could go wander and just make sure your brother gets lost or something like that. You don't have to really kill him. You could just leave him behind, you know, if you're in a caravan or something. But to go to the point of thinking, I'm going to draw blood, this is similar to the first, well, really technically the second sin in Genesis, which is the brothers Cain and Abel, the first murder. How dare you think of taking a life that, first of all, doesn't belong to you. That life belongs to the Lord. The mindset that we should be having is loving that person as the Lord loves them, correcting them as the Lord would correct that should be the mindset we should have, okay? So as a leader, we should be thinking of what would Jesus do? I know that becomes an old saying now, but we really should be saying that. What would Jesus do? How would he correct? So we see a sibling rivalry going on and this dream going on. And we see in verses five about the dream, that dreams were considered a means of divine communication in the Old Testament. Particular dreams like those Joseph has were believed to be prophetic. God used dreams when his people were leaving or outside the land, that is in the lands of atheists. In a dream, God announced to Abraham the Egyptian bondage in the first place. In a dream, God promised protection and prosperity for Jacob and his stay with Laban. And by two dreams, God predicted that Joseph would rule over his family. So dreams could be prophetic. Also, we know that by faith, Lord can use someone to reveal something prophetic to you. Okay? Now, they don't reveal a mystery. Let me be clear. The mystery is already revealed that is Christ incarnate. That's already revealed through the word of God. But someone can speak a prophetic word to you. As they pray to you, they can tell you something. For example, whether you're going to be a pastor. A great Bible teacher someone who's gonna be a great missionary that's a prophetic for you it's for the kingdom but that's personal for you but that's not a mystery revealed the mystery revealed is God incarnate in the flesh and he's coming back and it's already revealed so we see in verses 6 through 9 the scenes in the dream about the stacks of wheat bowing down and we go to verses 12 to 28. Genesis 37, verses 12 through 28. And this is when Joseph gets sold by his brothers. And it says in verse 12, Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shiam. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shiam. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. He said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent them off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shem, a man found them wandering in the fields and asked them, what are you looking for? And he replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dotan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dotan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. You see in verse 18, it wasn't like it was a, a last minute thing. They saw him walking in the distance, and they plotted. That means they planned. We see him 19, here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Look at, look at what goes into the planning stage. For those who don't know, cisterns are big, kind of like cement um, 
bowls that capture rainwater, which you use then to water the grounds and so on. They're thinking of throwing their brother after killing them in a, into an empty vessel to hide the body. So it's not just killing. Now you're already planning how to hide the body. So we go to verse 21. It says, when Reuben heard this, which is the oldest brother, he tried to rescue them from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. Now, why would Reuben want to save his brother? First of all, that is his brother. He is the oldest, so he might feel like he has a responsibility to care for his youngest brother. But there is a little bit of guilt there. For those who read the Bible, especially Genesis, at one point, Reuben covated, chased the concubine of his father. And his father caught him with his concubine. So there is some guilt there for what he did to his father. He says, I have to do better. So that's one of the reasons that most likely why he wanted to take care of his brother Joseph. We see in verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Now they start conniving again. Now here comes one of the brothers and says, hold on. Can't we benefit more than by not killing them and selling them? Can't we make money off him? Look at the way they're thinking now. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. Like, they really care for him. They're like, after all, he is our brother. Let's not kill him. Instead, let's make money off him. Like, that's any better. <laughs> and they go, he is our own flesh and blood. Let's just not kill him. Let's just make money off him. Let's sell him into slavery. That'll be better for him, you know? And his brothers agreed. So when the Minyak merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Now, mind you, Reuben wasn't there when they sold him. Reuben later on comes out. Because what Reuben was planning to do was, when his brothers were busy, they, he was going to take Joseph out to save him. They did this without Reuben, who's the oldest, and they sold him into slavery and then told Reuben later on. Reuben still rolled with the punches, and instead of telling the father, oh, your son is not dead, he went with the story of the brothers and told the father that he died. And then that same coat they were jealous of, that robe, they tore it up and made sure blood was on it and gave it to the father. Now, due to the sin of the father having favoritism for the youngest son, naturally, the father was never the same again. He cried and he was never the same because he lost his youngest son. Not because it was just his youngest son, but it was a son he wasn't expecting that was born at his older age. See, we have to be careful how we elevate our children. We cannot show favoritism. Even if you have an only child, I've known parents that sometimes baby their child so much, especially when it's an only child, especially when it's a miracle child from God. You know, we could baby our children to the extreme that we do more damage to them than good. I remember one parent, she always said, this is my miracle child to her daughter. And that's good, that's fine. Remind them that they're a miracle from God, the same way we're all a miracle from God, because we're all God's children. But don't go to the point of that you allow certain things to slide because this is your miracle child. You know, there has to be proper discipline. The same way in the church, you can't have such favoritism to the point that there's no proper discipline. I can't correct, let's say, Brother Eric, and then not correct CJ. They should be treated the same. If Eric and CJ do the same thing that is incorrect, they should be corrected in the same manner. It's the same sin. So why am I treating one sin different than the other when it's the same sin? And the other thing is, is that most churches, when they correct sin, they neglect to think sin is all the same. Yes, sin has categories, but it's all the same. Sin is sin. So if you stepped out in your marriage and CJ steals somebody's girlfriend, 
they're the same sin, because sin is sin. One is not any better than the other. We have to understand that. So I can't say, okay, eh, he's still that person's girlfriend, that's minor. Oh, he stepped out of his marriage. No, that's not good, because you know, you're married before God. It's still the same sin. You did something that was against the will of God. And not only that, you're violating a brother and sister in Christ. One thing I always remind you guys is that your loved one, your wife, your husband, is a soul for Christ first, then your husband or wife. If you have that mindset, you're less chance of doing harm. But if you don't have that mindset, some people think that when you're married, that's your property. They'll treat their spouse like property. They're not your property. First of all, they belong to the Lord. They don't belong to you. So you should treat them as someone who belongs to the Lord with great care. Because here's the thing, the Lord sees all. So what's gonna end up happening? Do you think God likes ugly? God don't like ugly. Don't mess with God's children. I've experienced that. When I had an incident when someone was like wanting to curse me out one time recently, this happened about in November, and I was gonna go out and I felt myself getting upset. And all of a sudden, the Lord just told me, shut up. And as soon as he rose, somebody else to defend me. And I just started laughing. And my wife was a witness to that. She was there when that happened. And my wife knows my temper as well. And I just felt my mouth to shut up. And as soon as I heard the Lord lift that other person, and that person went like a pimple against that person, I was like, God, don't like ugly. And I just started laughing. Because God will defend his children. God will correct. Even if man doesn't correct, God will correct. We all gonna have to give account at one point. When Jesus comes back, we all gonna have to give account. If you did something to someone who's a child of God, you're gonna have to give account. God knows if you truly repented or not. So we can't play games. We have to understand the time of Christ returns more sooner than ever. And what you gotta ask yourself is, Am I ready to give account? Am I ready to tell, tell God, I did the best I could. I lived a just life as possible. And I try to live a kingdom vision. If you can't say that, then you need to start repenting as of now. We need to repent. None of us are perfect. So if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, and this is in the NIV. And this is a letter from Paul. And he's warning the Corinthians against judging their leaders according to human wisdom instead of God's wisdom. He reminds them that it is God who feeds and grows the church. Sometimes we think that we grow the church. When God called me to pastorship, we, we know we're not at capacity, but we know we have a large outreach. We don't look at numbers. We look at souls. Are we reaching souls? Now, we have to understand no one is perfect. There are people that are close by, that live close by, and can cross the street and be in service, and choose not to. Now we understand it's cold out. Yeah, it's cold out. You know, there's a sacrifice, you know? And people have to learn to sacrifice their comfort of being warm at home, and being in the presence of the Lord, being in community, because we're called to be in community. The word of God shows us in Acts chapter 2, starting from verse 42, the church is a community. We're supposed to be gathering together. Why are we gathering together? Because we encourage each other. Here's the thing. You can be saved at home. Yes, you can be at home and saved and all well and good. But you're not going to grow. You're going to stay a baby Christian. You will never grow because you need the other to grow. Hence the anagram for joy. Jesus first. And in being intentional with others, yourself last. We need the other to grow. We need to look at each other as well as how God reveals that he uses the other to encourage us. So, for example, for those who don't know, I have issues with back pain, chronic pain, going on 15 years, almost 20 years. 
I'm here. Do I want to be at rest? Yes, I do. I've been up since 7 in the morning. First minister to another church, and then come over here and minister here. One of the brothers who saw me, who, who lives in my building, he, he was laughing because he came. He wanted to come to service. I always talk with him, and I pray with him. He lives in my building. And he came to church, but then he saw me leave. He says, you're not staying? I said, I'm getting ready for the other service. And he's like, oh, you? And he was like, you busy? I'm like, yes, there's stuff to do in the kingdom. So what we did, me and my wife said, but you stay here and get blessed. You're here. You walked in, you made the sacrifice you're here, get blessed. If you want to come here afterwards, feel free. The door is open. I know me and my wife back in the days, we used to get blessed going to different churches. You can learn a lot by visiting different churches. You can learn both good and bad, what not to do and what to do. We can always learn, and we're always learning until the day we're in heaven. So if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, and this is focusing on the church and its leaders. It says, brothers and sisters, I cannot address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Those are some heavy words. Mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worthy, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worthy? Are you not acting like mere humans? For one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers, notice that word, co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. One thing that happened during the pandemic, people thought that they were not going to survive because they were not physically in church. The church is us, each individual. We are saved, but we could have still had service. You could invite someone over, break bread, and still glorify the Lord. You could go to the coffee shop and still glorify the Lord, um, the Lord with others. So just because you couldn't be physically in the temple doesn't mean you couldn't have church. What ended up happening is a lot of people became lazy because they got accustomed to not having church. And the other part of that is because they weren't properly discipled. We see here Paul, who is a disciple and a disciple maker and a disciple grandfather. He's teaching his leaders. And what does he say? He says, I was giving you milk. He intended to give me, but since they were still living worldly, he couldn't give them any more than that. I still got to give you milk because you still haven't changed. There's a lot of people in church who are like that. There are people who are sitting in the pews, in the seats, and they're not growing. A person could be in the Lord 20 years and still be that baby Christian. And that's a shame. That's a shame because there's a lot of wasted service in the Lord. Because God created each and single, every one of us for a purpose. We're supposed to be working for the glory of God in the kingdom. But if you're not growing, all you're doing is delaying that purpose. But don't think God is going to be like, all right, CJ, you're not growing, so we're just not going to do this. No, God is just going to go, all right, CJ, you're not doing this, we're going to go to jail. Joe is hungry for the word, so I'm going to use Joe for this purpose. God is not just going to sit still. He's going to keep moving on. He's doing this for your benefit. He wants you to grow. But if you refuse to grow, remember, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force a horse to drink. And there's a lot of people who've been led to water and are just not drinking. So we need to understand that we have to be immersed in God's word. God's word is what helps sustain us, help us grow in spiritual maturity. We see here how sometimes we could be infants. There are people professing they're Christians, but they're doing the same things they were doing as before when they were in the world. That's nonsense. Come on, something has to change. There has to be some evidence of change. There has to be the fruit of the spirit. You have to be more loving. You have to be more kingdom minded. Something has to grow. 
When you see a child growing, do you not see them develop? First you see height, the type of food they eat. For example, DJ, when he was younger, all he would eat was chicken nuggets. Don't give him anything else. Well, he still loves it, but at least his palate is changing. He's having pizza now. It's changing. <laughs> But before, it was just chicken nuggets. That's it. Don't give him anything else. Now he's willing to try other things. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. That's growth. And that's what we have to keep in mind. As believers, we should be growing. Even if it's at our own pace. But we should be growing. We should be moving forward. Not going backwards. We should be moving forward. Because if we go backwards, we'll be like Sodom and Gomorrah. What was it that the Lord told them? Do not look back. Or else you end up like a pill of salt, like those in Sodom and Gomorrah. We have to keep a kingdom vision moving forward. And as we grow, we bless others. So at a certain point, we have to get off the milk. Let's be real. We have to get off the milk. We have to get in God's word. We have to grow in God's word. So we see in these verses that he could not continue babying them. So he says you can't continue remaining Worldly. So the Corinthians were impressed by appearances and were attached to the externals, meaning things of the outside. We see some believers doing that. There are believers that go to churches only because what they can get, not what they can give or how they can serve. Okay? They may go to a church because it's popular or because it has a great worship team that's famous and they've been on TV and so on. So because of this, they have fallen into the trap of admiring different Christian teachers so strongly it bordered on idolatry. Again, as I mentioned, do not raise a pastor higher than Jesus. The pastor is the under-shepherd of the Lord. He's there to do the Lord's will. If you see something that you love about him, know that you're seeing Jesus. You love Jesus. Don't fall so in love with the minister of God that you forget about Jesus. So it says, Godly certain, God certainly uses gifted people as leaders to reach folks whom others don't reach. But focusing on these leaders can be corrupted into pride, exclusivism, and be mesmerized to the point of idolatry. One of the things that was happening is some people were saying, I follow Paul. Some people said, I follow Apollo. I mentioned in prior preachings, there are people that are still following John the Baptist to this day. And lost focus on Jesus, who came and ascended. They're still waiting for the Messiah while following John the Baptist. John the Baptist is, is buried and in heaven, and they're still looking for the Messiah. People need to stop with their nonsense. They can't be looking at the external. We need to start looking at the heavenly things. We also see here that just because God can use you or an I does not mean that God cannot use the other. We get so enchanted by when God uses us sometimes that we start smelling ourselves. Remember what I told you about the anointing? If somebody comes to you and be like, wow, you smell so nice and you don't got cologne on it or that, it's not you they smell. It's the Lord. If you smell yourself, it might not be so pretty. So keep in mind, it's the anointing. So we see here as well that when we get too focused on pride, it corrupts the body of Christ. It corrupts the service for the kingdom. We get so mesmerized that we start elevating ourselves. And for example, if you see a church that starts raising money well for the kingdom, notice no church is supposed to be having a large amount of money in the bank. The money that goes in is supposed to go out. A church function in the church, when it, it formats as a corporation is, Keyword, non-profit, meaning you're not supposed to make money. So there shouldn't be a large amount of money in the bank. Should there be money? Yes, because we're supposed to be good stewards just in case there's a need in the body of Christ and so on. But you can't be, a, let's say, a mega church and have $20 million in the church. Like what happened in Dallas, and they had the flood, and then they closed the church, and they didn't let nobody in the church because they didn't want the church to get messed up. That was Joe Austin. I'm going to blow his spot up. And he only opened the church after so many people embarrassed him. And then he blamed his workers. He said, oh, no, it was dumb because they, they take care of the church and they didn't want the church to get dirty. Now what you did was you elevated the physical structure 
into an idol. We don't pray to these walls. We don't pray to this floor. We pray to Jesus. That's who should be elevated. We see in Romans chapter 6, if you go with me, Romans 6, verses 11 to 13. And we're going to close. Romans 6, verses 11 to 13 in the New International Version. It says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Notice that key word, do not let sin reign, meaning rule your body. So that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. But rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. It's recognizing that we're new creatures. We're alive in Christ. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. If you continue living in sin, can you be an instrument of righteousness? No. How many of you ever would drink out of a dirty cup? If you know somebody, and I'm going to be a little out there, if somebody urinated in a cup and then just threw it out and then gave you the cup, would you drink out of it? No. no. It's a dirty cup. has no use anymore until it gets clean. Same with us. In the world, we were doomed to close. Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 13 is revealing to us that we're a new vessel. So we're a clean cup. So why are we dirtying the cup over again? Meaning is that, are we perfect on this earth? No. We're going to have moments that we're going to commit sinful acts. That's why we repent to Jesus. Every time you pray, you should be asking forgiveness. There might be some things that you don't have come to mind that remind you that you did a sinful act. You might have said something to someone and you did it intentionally. Because we don't do things unintentionally. We did it intentionally and then we act like we didn't do it. And then we don't take responsibility for it. So let's be real. So what we do is we ask the Lord for forgiveness because we know we sometimes could be, you know, messed up. Let's be real. We're human. We're still on this earth. I try to be very intentional at all times. It is not easy. The best way to think to do is bite your lip. Simple as that. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say it at all. Very easy. Uh, but for some people, it's more difficult than others. And part of that is where you are in your spiritual growth. How far have you grown? That's where that comes from. If you haven't grown much, then your mouth is always going to be flapping. That's what it comes down to. If you're growing, then your mouth is not flapping as much. If you're grown, then you know when to control that mouth. It's very simple. It's not that complicated. People make it more complicated than what it is. You know? So if you truly love the Lord, you know to control your mouth, control your appendages, meaning every part of this body belongs to the Lord. So I shouldn't do anything that would violate it, that would offend the Lord. So whenever I have an issue with a person, I try to first pray to the Lord before I engage with that person. It's being intentional. One of the things we have to learn in the walk of Christ is being more intentional. Are we doing this or are we doing that? There should be no doubts. Do I intend harm to this person? If you don't intend harm, then that means you should be praying, how can I best handle this situation? If somebody's offending me and they're upsetting me, and I feel that in this flesh I'm getting upset, then I need to ask the Lord, Lord, direct me on how I can best handle this situation. Because there are people in the world that will handle it the way their flesh desires. So for example, before I serve the Lord, Whenever somebody got me upset, the logical thing is, I will either hit you, stab you. As a kid, I was taught to beat somebody up with a Heinz glass bottle. Hey, these are the things that, that I was taught. You know, in the Lord, I have to handle things differently now. Somebody offends me, somebody pushed me, I have to be like, Lord, even if it was a quick pair. Lord, guide me on here, give me peace. Help me in this situation. And you know what? You'd be surprised how quick the Lord responds. I've ministered in very rough neighborhoods. I've never had to really lay hands on anyone in a rough neighborhood. So this is what we have to keep in mind. Are you living intentional? Are you living for Christ? Are you understanding that this battle, because this is a spiritual battle that you have with your flesh and the spirit, because the flesh is going to want to do certain things that you're not supposed to do. The spirit is going to want to do things that the flesh doesn't want to do. Who rules? Who drives this car? It's the spirit. 
Don't be letting the flesh. The, the flesh is a passenger. It's like if you drive and you have a person who, who, who's a passenger and they tell you turn right, turn right, turn right. Are you really listening to them? Maybe. I don't pay no mind. <laughs> if I know which direction I'm going. Now, if I need directions, then that person will guide me. Same with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, guide me. But I shouldn't be listening to outside voices. You know, one of the things in this world that we tend to notice is there's a lot of outside voices that have a lot of opinions. Right? So if you get in a situation and somebody tells you, ah, oh, you should have beat that person down, that's an outside voice. Are you walking in Christ with me? Are you giving me godly advice? If you're not giving me godly advice, then you need to step over there. I don't need to listen to you. I need to listen to godly counsel. Because you know what? Godly counsel will help me get through that situation in a godly manner. That's what we need to do. When I was working in the circular world, that was a constant battle I had in the beginning because a lot of people who were working with me were not Christian. So what ended up happening is whatever, someone upset me or whatever, they would be like, oh, why are you letting that person talk to you that way? Oh, uh, I said, I'm letting that person talk to me that way because before the Lord, I would just go take that person in front of their daughter and kill them in front of their daughter. I can't do those things because I'm in the Lord now. So now I have to do things differently. When I said that to them, they looked at me and they were shocked and they were like, you don't understand who you're speaking to. You're trying to dig the old man out and the old man I'm trying to keep buried. And basically what I tend to do is I keep the shovel at hand. So whenever that rear head comes out, I'll be like, get down there. Nobody told you to get out here. There's nothing out here for you. We need to learn how to do that. We're so quick to take the shovel and instead dig the old man up. Let him handle it. Not thinking that you have a responsibility in that part you're gonna end up paying the ultimate price. So remember, there's still repercussions for sin on this world, on this earth. So if you do something like say, for example, if I end up murdering someone, I might go to jail. So this is gonna be a big deal, not just for me, not just for that family member who lost a loved one, but for the Christ, the church. What's gonna end up happening here, you see, I had an incident recently, right? And I was telling my wife that th this situation happened. And I said, if this would have turned out the wrong way, the first thing someone's going to say, oh, but he's a pastor. Because that's the, how they know me as. So they're going to be critical because I'm as a pastor, not a human being. We have to understand none of us are perfect. But we have to have a kingdom vision. We can't act on our own because we no longer own ourselves. We're bond servants to Christ, meaning we belong to Christ. We don't belong to ourselves anymore, so we can't do the things we did before. We can't handle things the way we did before. We have to handle them as Christ would like us to handle. It's like when they came for Christ, and they were going to arrest him. Peter was quick to cut somebody's ear off. What did Jesus do? He healed that guard. I told Peter, no. But at the same time, he warned Peter. He says, you know, before the crow, um, the, the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. And he's smelling himself saying, I would never deny you, Lord, never. What ended up happening? Denied them all three times. We can never think that we can't fall. If we have a, a kingdom vision of understanding that none of us are perfect, that any of us can fall, we're more able to see when the enemy's trying to trip us up. It's like when you walk, do you ever look at the street to see if there's a crack on the curb? I'm the kind of person when I walk, I'm always looking to see at the where I'm walking. Why? Because I don't want to trip. Because as my wife would joke, if I trip, I'll go into pieces. The way my body is right about now, I can't afford to fall. I'll need two, three people to get me up. So I have to make sure I prevent that. The same way we have to prevent our fall in Christ, that we don't fall into the world. We need to keep a kingdom vision. Am I watching where I'm stepping? Am I watching where I'm going? Not that where I'm going is sinful, but did the Lord say it's okay for me to go there? Because if the Lord didn't give me permission to go there, then that's not where I'm supposed to be. Meaning that something can happen there that can affect me spiritually as well as my physical well-being. How many of you know that shooting that happened in Sangria recently? The restaurant. I heard about it. There was a shooting about two, three days ago. Mm -hmm. We should be seeking Holy Spirit discernment wherever we go. Who would have thought the people that went to eat there that that would have happened? 
I'm sure no one went there eating thinking, I might catch a bullet. No one went with that mindset. That's why we have to be ready to go with Christ. And we should be asking Christ discernment of where we're going. Not that the place is sinful, is that whether that's where the Lord wants you to be. There are places that are not where we're supposed to be. You know what we're supposed to be? Growing. That's what we're supposed to be. Constantly growing. And that's what this message is about. We need more unity in the body of Christ. We need to be constantly growing and we need to be immersed in God's word. Because you can't grow without God's word. That's why we're reading through the word together. If you're not God's word, you're not growing. If you're not growing, you're no use to the kingdom. And if you're not no use to the kingdom, what's happening here? As Paul was revealing, you're worthy people. As much as you profess, you're Christian, you're worthy people. Because you're letting the world dictate your decisions, not the Lord. Let's not be worthy people. We are all new creatures in Christ. We need to act like it more. So that's what I hope this message encourages you. I hope it blesses you. I want to pray with you that you all continue walking in God's grace. So we're going to all stand. We thank you, Lord, for this blessed day. Lord, Father God, I present all these brothers and sisters that stand here before you, Lord, that you continue to guide them in your Holy Spirit, Lord, that they continue to serve you godly, Lord, Father God. Lord, that you guide them, Lord, that you guide them in their service, Lord, in what capacity they're called to serve you in your body, Lord, Father God. That you continue to give them encouragement, Lord, that they desire to be always in love with your word, Lord, that they continue growing in your spirit, Lord, and that they may be anxious for your return, Lord Jesus. Lord, that you watch over those who may watch this later on, that you bless them, Lord, Father God, that your word touch their heart, their spirit, Lord, that there are many who may hear this message, and if they don't know you, they desire to grow in your relationship, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. amen.